Good day. My name is David Wild, and this is part one of a three-part lecture on chapter seven on managerial decision-making from Connect Master Management 2.0. At the end of this lesson on managerial decision-making, you will be able to explain why decision-making is a critical issue to managers and organizations, to differentiate between the modes of decision-making, to describe the styles of decision-making and the factors that need to be considered in choosing among them. You'll be able to describe four challenges to individual decision-making, to analyze examples of the different decision-making heuristics and biases, to describe challenges to team decision-making, and finally, to recommend remedies for team decision-making challenges. First, let's talk about what is decision-making. Decision-making is widely considered to reflect a process of making a choice or selecting a course of action among alternatives that may be concrete or assumed to address a problem. The word problem in this definition should be interpreted broadly as meaning any inquiry for which an answer is desired. So why do we care about decision-making? Decision-making is a major area of interest for those who study management. Why is this? Not only does the job of a manager hinge on making effective decisions each and every day, but managers are also responsible for others who make decisions. Moreover, regardless of whether decisions need to be made in the normal course of performing work or in dealing with unusual occurrences, that may never happen again, the consequences of poor decisions can have major negative impacts on the organization, its customers, employees, and the decision makers themselves. Let's look at individual versus team decision making. The topic of decision making is complicated because it can involve either individuals or teams of individuals and the factors that determine decision-making effectiveness in each context are unique. Individual decision-making, this is when the person is solely responsible for interpreting the problem, gathering information, considering alternatives, and making a choice. In team decision-making, individual team members may have different levels of knowledge and expertise regarding a problem, and have very different perspectives that influence how they frame the problem and weigh choices. Team members also make individual judgments that feed into a team decision, but a team decision involves the integration of these judgments in some way. Team decisions almost always involve some degree of interaction and exchange of ideas and information among members. Now, let's look at the effectiveness of decision-making. There are three different metrics that could be used to judge whether a decision is good or bad, the accuracy, consensus, and acceptability of that decision. In situations where there is an objectively verifiable correct decision to a problem, the outcome of interest is decision-making accuracy. This metric indicates the degree of correspondence between a decision and the correct decision, or the decision that should have been made in that particular situation, even if this can only be known after the fact. The importance of decision-making accuracy applies to decisions made by individuals or teams. In contrast, consensus is a metric for decision-making effectiveness that applies uniquely to teams. Specifically, consensus refers to the degree to which members of a team generally agree with the team's choice. There are many circumstances in which it might be difficult and time-consuming to gather all the information available and to do the necessary analysis to find the optimal choice. There are also situations in which it is not absolutely crucial that an optimal solution is ever reached. In these types of circumstances, what we generally care about is whether the decision clears some hurdle of acceptability, that is, the degree to which a decision is likely to meet an overall objective or goal. A decision maker 
or team that uses acceptability as a metric for decision-making effectiveness is engaging in what is known as satisficing. Satisficing means that a decision-maker accepts an available option as being satisfactory. So in summary, in talking about what is decision-making, organizations come into existence and sustain themselves because of decisions made by individuals and teams. To make effective decisions, insight into the complexities of individual and team decision-making processes is necessary. Perhaps the most fundamental complexity is that the effectiveness of decisions can be judged in different ways. For example, accuracy may be important in some settings, consensus is important in others. It is also true that in some situations, all that really matters is that an acceptable decision gets made in a timely manner. Now, let's talk about the modes of decision making. The basic decision making processes are driven to a large degree by the nature of the problem that confronts the decision maker. In short, whereas some problems are familiar and therefore involve choices or decisions that might seem straightforward or obvious, there are other problems that are novel or unusual and therefore involve choices or decisions that require a more systemic evaluation. Intuition. When a problem or, or problem context appears to be familiar to an individual, decision-making often occurs through intuition, the nearly instantaneous judgments we make about a situation based on past experience without conscious thought. In plain language, intuition involves gut feelings that may be difficult to understand and even explain in rational terms. The advantage of employing experts who use intuition to make decisions should be obvious. Experts can take seemingly complicated situations and issues and resolve them quickly using intuition rather than lengthy analysis and deliberation. Although the use of intuition can lead to good decisions, there are limitations to this decision-making approach. First, the in intuition on which experts rely to make decisions may be quite difficult to explain in terms of all the factors that were considered and weighed. Second, the expertise on which the intuition is based can be wrong. Indeed, estimates are that it takes 10 years to become an expert in a given field. And by that time, new technologies and research findings can make expertise outdated. For this reason, some have advocated the use of evidence-based management, the process of using current, concrete research evidence when making decisions. Now, let's talk about programmed versus non-programmed decision-making. First, programmed decisions are made in response to recurring organizational problems or situations that are relatively familiar. They tend to trigger a response that results from learning and experiences in the same or very similar situations. Non-programmed decision-making, on the other hand, refers to choices made regarding problems that are novel and complex. These problems are unique and may be difficult to understand, and experience does not provide a foundation for making an informed decision. Therefore, rather than relying on experience, standard operating procedures, or well-known organizational practices or policies, decision makers need to address non-program problems using a more effortful and rational approach. So in summary, in talking about the modes of decision making, the process of decision making varies with respect to whether it results from intuition or a more rational process. When a problem or situation is familiar to an individual, decisions are usually made based on a intuition or a person's gut feelings. Program decisions are made in response to recurring problems or situations in an organization. Non-program decisions are made in response to problems or situations that are unique or complex and could have important consequences for the organization. When making non-program decisions, managers should address these problems with rationality rather than intuition. And that ends 
the first part of the lecture on managerial decision-making.